Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ghost Education 101. I'm excited to have everyone here, and I am looking forward to today's presentation. We have the Haunted Librarian with us, and we are covering unsolved murder cases today, just one of many upcoming presentations that she has for us. And I am looking forward to that one. But before we get started, if you guys can please share this video with your friends on Facebook and let them know about Ghost Education 101. And also, if you can give us a like, we'd love to make sure that you stay on top of our upcoming shows and presentations that we will be hosting throughout the rest of the year. And I guess I'm going to hand this over to you, Lisa, and let yes. you get things going. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. I'm so happy to be back. And so just a little plug um, for the April show, I'll be talking about Voodoo, Wicked New Orleans, which ties into quackery <laughs> med medicine. Um, I'm researching this. Uh, he's a physician, physician who purchased a, the pharmacy, which is the pharmacy museum in New Orleans from the pharmacist who owned it. And so it's gonna be all things voodoo related and medicine, um, medical quackery for the April show. Very excited. I'm looking forward to that one too. <laughs> oh, totally different, right? So tonight I'm talking about unsolved murders and these, they're, um, it's a total of four that I'm talking about. Three of them you all have probably heard of at least one of them, because they're very famous unsolved murders. But the first one ties into uh, the fourth one, like 1.5, um, you may not have known about and the possible links with them. So it, it's kind of interesting and it's sad because it does deal with children um, because it's, it, it's so sad to me that we still have unsolved murders. But I am planting the seed in terms of the fourth one I'm going to talk about in terms of DNA and the advances in DNA might be able to solve that one, not in who killed them, but if they actually survived. So, so those are like the um, note taking prompts for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I have, um, I don't, um, I, I, gosh, it's been like forever since I've been here. Um, do you share my screen? Is that how it works? No, you, you at the bottom of your um, screen, you uh, should have a share button. I, I do. Thank you. See, thank I you. need I need all of this. Um, all of this help. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yeah, this is right, because it reminds me of when I was teaching. So I had to do the entire screen <laughs> and share it. So it kind of. Uh, see, I've been gone too, too long, too long. <laughs> so let's see. OK, so do you see the murders? Yep. Okay, so I'm trying to move my mouse out of the way. And so um, murder, unsolved cases. And so this is part of a series that I'm going to start writing about this year on unsolved murders or um, how crime is solved and tying it to possible hauntings related to the site or the victims or some aspect of it, either paranormal links with it or possible or just something where you're like, what were they thinking because of what could happen? So again, we're going to talk about four cases. The first one are the Grimes sisters. And this one is December 28th, 1956 in Chicago, Illinois. It's actually a suburb of Chicago. And so Patricia and Barbara were sisters. They were in a family... Um, I believe they had three siblings with them. Their parents were divorced. They lived with her mom. Barbara is on the left-hand side. She was 15 and Patricia is on the right side and she was 12. And they were huge Elvis Presley fans, um, like number one and number two fans of Elvis. And they wanted to go see the back-to-back -back showing of his new movie, Love Me Tender, which they had already seen 11 times. And so they went to the theater. Their mom gave them only enough money to handle, to cover the ticket cost and concessions, nothing more. And they had, their one friend was sitting behind them who was in the first showing. The friend decided that she, want, she was going home so that was the last time she saw saw them. And so after the second showing, they were supposed to head home 
take the bus and they disappeared on their way home. And no one knew what happened to them. And so there were rumors flying about that they were unhappy at home, that they wanted to go see Elvis because they were his biggest fans and that they were heading to Graceland. And Elvis Presley actually came out and publicly talked to the media and said, essentially, um, you know, you're good girls. It's time to head home. Go home to your mama. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. So on January 22nd of the new year, which is important because we're crossing over from 1956 to 1957, they find their bodies. Um, they were nude and they were frozen. And this is the police officer pointing to where the bodies were found. They were found off of German Church Road and um, by Devil's Creek, which is kind of um, ominous, right? And what's interesting is this um, this man found them. He thought they were mannequins. And so he pulled off the side of the road, thought they were mannequins, and went up to them and was kind of freaked out. So he went home, picked up his wife. The wife came <laughs> with him. And um, then they notified the police, which I would think is suspicious. But he wasn't looked at as a suspect, um, although there were quite a few suspects. In the case, there were, I think they did like 2,000 interviews. I mean, this was a huge case in Illinois. And what's also fascinating with the case, not just that it was two sisters who disappeared, but the coroners couldn't come to a consensus actually how they died. And they, um, they were nude and they were out in the elements and there was heavy snow that they theorized covered them. They theorized, they looked at the contents of their stomach. And so they died soon after they disappeared on the 28th. So it wouldn't have been into January that they had survived. They weren't, um, they weren't, um, stabbed, injured in any way. Barbara did have sexual activity, but they couldn't say that it was, you know, non-consensual, but Patricia did not. And um, they were laid where Barbara was on the bottom, Patricia was on top and um, covering Barbara's head, which is sad. And unfortunately, um, wildlife got to them, but they, they had this horrible winter, but they had this unseasonable heat wave for winter. And it was because of the melting snow and ice that their bodies were actually uncovered and found. And this is the road that it looked like then. It does not look like that now, but there were at least four suspects. And so the first one was Edward Lee Benny. He went by Benny Bedwell. He was age 21. He was semi-literate, uh, drifter who resembled Elvis. And so the theory was that the girl saw him, thought he looked like Elvis and followed him and his friend, William, um, for shenanigans kind of thing. Then there was Max Fleeg. He was age 17. He was actually, um, he knew them. He was an acquaintance of theirs. He confessed, but his facts and his confession actually didn't support any of the evidence. And so the police were like, he didn't do it. So they let him go. And then there was Walter Krantz and Walter Krantz was 53 year old steam fitter, but he was also a psychic. And Walter had a dream where he saw the girls and he contacted the police in an effort to help, to assist. But the police you know, again, this is, you know, 1956, 1957, the police were very skeptical of him and thought he wanted attention and that he possibly is the person who committed the crime. And then we have Charles Leroy Melquist, who was 23. He was a stone worker and he was actually tied to the deaths well after um, 1956. Um, and it's because he was convicted in 1958 for smothering Bonnie Lee Scott to death, which is the 1.5 story that um, some of the audience has not heard about. And so those were the main suspects. 
And so this is Benny. And so that's Benny with his mom. And I guess he kind of looks like Elvis. I'm not really sure. Maybe in profile. Um, and this was one of the newspaper articles. Um, Skid Row dishwasher admits slugging two sisters to death. And his story was that he and the man on the right, William Willingham Jr., picked the girls up, took them back to um, one of their apartments, um, fed them hot dogs, and beat them to death. Well, just like Max, his confession didn't align with the evidence, and especially the contents in their stomach. There wasn't hot dogs in their stomach. There, None of the evidence was there. And so the police had to let him go. And so then we have Max, we have Walter, and now we have Charles. And um, his story is a little bit weird. And he kind of looks like Elvis too. But I guess maybe men of that generation might have because back in the 50s, we were all dressing up and <laughs> not in our casual wear. But this is um, large crowds at their funeral. Um, it rocked the town, rocked it. And um, these are the two death certificates. And the um, the de the coroners actually classified their deaths as, and I grabbed the wrong binder, so I'm going to have to go off memory. Um, classified their deaths basically because they were outside in the elements, and you can't really see it. I might need to get a better copy of it because um, here's a pro tip: Ancestry. You can get a lot of death certificates, especially when you're looking at your family history. And um, so they couldn't say anything. They couldn't determine strangulation. They um, uh, wasn't poison, wasn't drugs in their system, but they just didn't know really how they died. So there are actually some online errors that I do want to point out because this kind of, um, kind of hurts in a way that we have this horrible death or these horrible murders, these two murders, and people who are writing about these murders online can't get the facts straight. And it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's not that hard, right? Um, this is the mom, Loretta. And Loretta is actually spelt with two R's, L-O-R-R-E-T-T-A. And if you go to find a grave and you look at um, the entries for Barbara and Patricia, you'll see that there's actually a note in the bottom where the uh, person who provided the information notes that her name is misspelled online a lot, a lot. And then the other one is the age of Patricia because Patricia's birth date was actually December 31st. And this is where the contents of her stomach come, kind of come into play in terms of determining when they died because they couldn't really pinpoint that either. So she was 12 when she went to the theater and she would have turned 13 on December 31st. And so presumptively, um, they're saying the death is unknown when they died, but we have this time frame of a few weeks, December 28th to um, January 22nd when they were found. Um, so she might have turned 13, but the coroners did say that based on the contents of their stomach, she didn't. So she was 12. She was 12, which is sad. And then what's horrible, um, the mom is holding a missing flyer. Um, Mrs. Grimes actually received a ransom note from a prankster who just wanted to see if she would pay. But let's talk about Charles. Charles Leroy Melquist. Um, and here he looks a little bit more like Elvis, maybe smoky eyes. He was arrested in 1958 for murdering Bonnie Lee Scott. And Bonnie Lee, the case had a lot of similarities, some crossover with Barbara and Patricia. And she was found nude, but she was decapitated. And he, he actually confesses to that. But her remains were found just a few miles from where the Grimes sisters were found. And so online sleuths and... Um, True crime fans kind of generated this buzz. Not well, it was before the internet, but generated this buzz, and it's continued online, linking him to the two murders, which is a fascinating theory, right? So, who was Bonnie? Bonnie was 15 years old, which is 
kind of stunning too. I look at this picture and think that she was probably in her twenties, but I always forget that we dressed up a little better than we do now. Um, she, her parents were actually going through a divorce. And so she was living with her aunt and uncle, Jean and Robert Shallow and the, her cousin, Sue and her maternal grandmother, Doris Hitchens. And so she was living with them and they thought that she was just the sweetest girl. Um, she was respectful. She was, she went to school. She was a good student. She, she was just the perfect suburban teenager. And when she disappeared, um, she was last seen at 630 on September 22nd, 1958 in Addison. When she disappeared and the police started investigating, they found that Bonnie wasn't so innocent. Bonnie, um, had um, some boyfriends. She really wasn't attending school regularly. She was she she had put this facade on for her aunt and uncle, which by no means is an invitation to murder. I'm not saying that, but somehow it put her in the path of Leroy, who was 23 year old stone worker. And um, what's interesting is Leroy. Um, and always remember, criminals are incredibly stupid. For the most part, Leroy actually approached police as a witness to seeing Bonnie, saying, I saw her. Um, and so they he fit into the timeline of last scene. And um, so they actually had him um, voluntarily. He came to the police station and he's giving this interview about the last time he saw her, not realizing that they had a search warrant to search his 1958 silver Chevrolet, where they found all of the evidence or a lot of evidence linking him to the murder because um, he didn't clean his car. <laughs> what? Um, and that's, that's how he was found. Um, I think what might be a judicial travesty is that he was sentenced to 99 years and he was paroled 11 years later. He was let out for this murder. He smothered her. Um, what happened was they went out on a date. They got into an argument and he put a pillowcase over her head. He smothered her. He um, stripped off her clothes, dumped her body. And then again, this is another thing that if you watch TV crime shows, you will know that Criminals like to go back to the scene of the crime. Well, he went back to the scene of the crime and he um, went back to see how she was doing. And he he was trying to hide her body. And so he cut off her head and kicked it to the side and um, thinking no one would find her. And unfortunately, somebody out on a hike found her body. This is the road going back to Patricia and Barbara. And if you search online, there are some videos talking about some possible hauntings at this location. And um, there's one video in particular that unfortunately has a lot of errors in it. And one of, one of the things that is not noted is that this road has since been widened. And so when people go there and talk about feeling a haunting, um, feeling the presence and so forth. They're actually, your the cars actually traverse over where their bodies were found, which, um, you know, they, I don't know if they're, if they're still there. I hope that they aren't because it is such a travesty and uh, is so tragic. Right. Um, but it is one of, it, it's sadly one of the famous unsolved murders in America right now is of these two sisters. And so that would be Patricia and Barbara Grimes. The second story of the famous ones are the Lawson family. This one a lot of people know about because it happened at Christmas. And um, so we've got Christmas Day, 1925, or um, December 25th, 1929, and we are in Germantown, North Carolina. And we have the family portrait here. And we have, if um, looking at it, third from the left is um, Lawson. And he's 43 years old. And his wife, Fanny. And they had a farm. And so he was a tobacco farmer. And they had six children total. Um, 
one, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, they had seven. Um, that's right. They had set, sorry, seven children, six of them he killed. I'm, I just want to make sure that my math is wrong. And I spell Arthur wrong on the bottom there. Gosh, don't you hate it when you proofread slides and then you're like, oh, there's an error. Um, so we had, I, I do it all the time. So don't feel bad. Holy crap. Right. I'm like, <laughs> and it, it's like, what? It's just staring at me. Um, I, know, I film for the library and it's like, I swear I proofread people. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, right. I feel so horrible. Uh, because it, and it's sitting on its own line. So it's like it's almost blinking at me. Hello. So um, so we have Arthur, the um son. We have Marie Levon in the middle. We have the baby Mary Lou in Fanny's hands. We have James and Raymond um with um Lucinda Maybell. She actually went by Maybell and Carrie. So um that would be um, James, Maybell, Raymond, and then Carrie, if we're going in order across. And, um, and, and you have to remember, too, back in 1929, we, um, not we, because I wasn't alive then, but people stood for very long times to get their photographs. You didn't smile, really, in the photographs. And um, we'll talk about that, too, the menacing smile. But these were two of the headlines that happened. Um, farmer slays wife and six children. Crazy farmer kills wife, six children, then lays them out for burial and then goes to end his own life. So what happened was it's um, Christmas morning. They get up and the eldest daughter um, is she makes a cake, Christmas cake. The two young girls, Maybell and Carrie, go off to see their aunt and uncle. Um, and so they're getting ready to go off. Arthur, and here's where some of the online stories differ. Arthur, the son, was either out with the father out hunting Christmas morning, or he was out with a friend hunting Christmas morning. Somehow he ran out of shell cake, um, ammunition. And so he either went to, walked into town to go buy more ammunition on his own or his father sent him. Don't really know. But during that time when Arthur was gone, the father um, kills the um, mother. He starts with the mother, Fanny, and she's sitting on the front porch peeling potatoes. She then kills the daughter. And I'm going to move forward. Actually, I'm going to go back so I can look at the order. Um, then he goes back and kills Marie. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I take that back. He started out with Maybell and Carrie as they were going to the aunt and uncle. They're walking through the farm and he comes out of the tobacco barn and kills them. So they're one and two. Comes and kills Fanny, not the baby yet. Kills Marie. Then um, the two boys are trying to run away and he kills them. And then he kills the four month old last, Mary Lou. So we've got Charles Davis. His name's Charlie. A lot of, a lot of Charles. I don't know why. Um, so they wanted to move closer to be by his brothers. And so they worked hard to get themselves by a farm. And so they were considered middle class. And so on um, a few weeks before Christmas, he loaded all of the family up and they went into town. He bought brand new clothes for all of them, had them wear the clothes and they went to a professional photographer and they sat for this family photograph. And what's interesting is that People like to try and read into photographs and not thinking that people, you know, look serious as they're standing in front of the photograph because they're not used to getting their photograph taken all the time. But we have Carrie who's kind of smiling, but people like to point to Charles, the father, and say, oh, his little grimace was him knowing that at Chris on Christmas morning he is going to slaughter his family. And I, I don't know. I think you're reading a little bit too much into it. But um, the sad thing is that he either shot them or bludgeoned them or shot them and then bludgeoned him. And that's what he did with the four month old, which is horrible. Absolutely horrible. 
But people, you know, wanted to know why. And so here are their coffins all laid out. Huge crowds came to pay their respects. As you can see there, they actually lived in a cabin that they were remodeling. And so Marie, the oldest um, girl, was helping them remodel inside. And, um, they, you know, people just wanted to know what would drive a man to do this? What, what would drive a father to do this? And so the, the strange thing is after this happened, his one brother, Marion, opened up the cabin. So we'll go back to the picture of the cabin. Opened up the cabin as um, dark tourism back in 1929. He would charge 25 cents for people to tour the cabin. He still had um, the cake that um, Marie had made and it had raisins on it. And people started stealing the raisins from the cake. And so then they put the cake under glass. And then he would charge 25 cents for them to purchase a pamphlet to go along with it. And the um, justification was that Arthur, spelled correctly this time, um, needed money to, to survive. And so this was to help pay for um, his um, upbringing after it. They are all buried on um, or in Browder Family Cemetery, which is um, now closed to only family. It's a very small cemetery. Most of it is actually cataloged on Find a, find a Grave. This is the um, monument. They actually had eight children, but they lost William to pneumonia in 1920. So they had already lost one one child, one son. So theories, because people like to rationalize or try and figure out the criminal mind or to figure out why this happened. And so decades later, someone was writing a book and got in contact with some of the relatives and um, got into contact with um one of Marie's friends, and all of this is hearsay. It would be inadmissible in court, but they um, rumors started that Charles actually had raped and impreg in, impregnated his eldest daughter and either um, Fanny knew and it was the um, family secret going to be exposed or um, Fanny didn't know, and he threatened Marie by saying, if you tell anybody, then um, I'm going to get rid of the whole family. No one really knows. And then people, again, like to speculate um, and look at Marie and say, well, she's not really showing, uh, right? I don't know. So it's horrible. But it didn't just end there, really. Um, James Arthur Buck Lawson, the oldest son, he survived. He went on to marry and have four children, but he died at the age of 31 in a freak car accident, which some online people have him dying in 1930s. And it's like, no, he died in 1945. He just happened to be 31. But a freak truck um, accident, he died, which is sad. Very sad. So what happened to the property, right? Um, this is the Brook Cove Road property in North Carolina. The cabin was torn down. The, um, whoops, ooh, I'm sneaking ahead. Um, and the limber from the cabin was actually used to build a covered bridge. This is that moment where you're like, what? Right, like covered bridges are kind of notorious for being haunted or they're, they're like a good focal point for urban legends, right? The spooky covered bridge. How would you like to drive over one made from wood from a cabin of a farm where a family was slaughtered? I don't know that I would want to drive over that road. I don't know. So then we have the third story. Man, I'm blowing through them, aren't I? Oh, maybe there's questions. This one's like, they're all sad. Right. The, yeah, there are no the, questions yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know if anybody's on watching. <laughs> no, they're they're watching and they're commenting, but there's no questions yet. Okay. I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm like, so if anyone yeah, has yeah. questions, feel free to ask. 
please do. Please do. Um, this one is like, um, is even, if you could even think of something even worse, right, than the three stories that I've already shared, we have the Sodder children. And um, this one actually is a little close to home because this is where my dad's family's from. And so, like, I have all kinds of questions. Um, so we have the Sodder children, and this is, um, <laughs> again, I have another typo. It, this is just crazy. It's actually December 25th. This is another Christmas Day tragedy. But we're in 1945. We are in Fayetteville, West Virginia. And I didn't realize, which is kind of crazy since my dad's family is from here, but Fayetteville has a very large, and it's a small town, very large Italian immigrant population. And so Giorgio, who went by George in the United States, and Jenny, they both emigrated um, um, to America separately. And, um, but then met in Smithers, they were living in Smithers, West Virginia, which is a small town close to Fayetteville. And they had 10 children and um, their older son, um, I don't know that he was the oldest, but Joe is his name. He actually was in the military. So he was away from the house and Christmas Eve, some of the kids, the um, nine kids, they opened up a few presents. They had lights on. They um, went to bed awaiting Christmas morning and um, Christmas or in the midnight to 1.30 a.m., the phone rang. And so Jenny got up and she answered the phone and someone asked, a female voice asked for a male person. And Jenny was like, I'm sorry, that person doesn't live here. And she hung up and she didn't really think anything of it. She saw that the door was unlocked. She saw that the lights were on. Um, so she turned off the lights, she locked the door and she went, she went back to bed. And then sometime between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., a fire broke out and they had a um, multi-story house and the fire broke out. George and Jenny and four of her children, four of their children got out, but five of them did not. And so they were presumed to have perished in the fire. So a few, few days to a few weeks before the fire, um, George was very passionate about Italian politics and he was um, opinionated. He didn't like um, Mussolini. He was um, he was very proud to be living in America. And he had supposedly this um, verbal altercation with an insurance salesman. And the insurance salesman, as the story goes, supposedly said, um, you know, if you don't buy the life insurance, then your house is going to burn and something's going to happen to your family. And he didn't buy the life insurance. When Jenny went to sleep that night, back to bed from the phone call from 1 a.m. to 1.30, she thought she heard something hit the roof of the house. Possibly um, like a Molotov cocktail kind of thing to light the house on fire. Witnesses say that they think they saw the five children in a dark car driving away in the middle of the night uh, when the fire broke out. What's really horrifying is that um, 1.30, fire breaks out. The phone lines, they can't get in touch with the fire department. Their phone lines, they think have the lines have burned. The one of the children go to the neighbor, um, neighbor calls and no one picks up the phone and answers at the fire station. Then different stories, of course, because the Internet is like the bevy of story mutations. Um, one story says that people at a nearby tavern saw the fire and alerted the police. Another one says that the child went to yet another neighbor who finally got a hold of the police or the fire department, um, chief of the fire department. And the reason why they didn't arrive on scene until eight in the morning, seven, six and a half to seven hours later is because they had to do a phone tree to dial up people to catch the fire truck to go to the fire. 
And so during this time, it took 45 minutes for the house to burn down. And George is trying to think of what he can do. And so he actually has two trucks on the property. Um, he can't find his ladder. His ladders to the second floor is missing. He thinks that if he gets in his truck, he can pull the truck close enough to the house, to the second floor, because the five children were sleeping upstairs in two rooms, that he could get upstairs to get the children out. Neither truck would start. And, and so it's just, it, it's like, you know, one obstacle after another, after another, after another. And the house burned down 45 minutes. The following morning, um, they just they're heartbroken. They're sad. And they believe that their five children died in a fire. But they didn't. Because when they excavated through the debris, no human remains were found of the children. The mother was um, so distraught over this because they would tell her things like, oh, well, um, their fire, their bodies would have burned, the bones would have cremated. And she actually went and um, talked to people who um, they would experiment with animal bones to burn and the fire didn't get that hot. So it wasn't hot enough. Bones would, wouldn't over 45 minutes, there wasn't enough time for them to be to disintegrate and there weren't any, any human remains found. So the parents still grieving put out, this is one of their flyers and this is a picture of the five children. So we've got Maurice, we've got Martha, we've got Lewis, we've got Jenny, and then we've got Betty and the five children. And they happen to be the um, youngest except for the baby and the baby actually slept in a crib in the parents bedroom so that's how the baby was able to get out um, um john and um let me go back i'm oh, sorry um oh i don't have them listed i do later um let me move forward then okay here we go so sylvia is um the baby two years old um George, Marion, and John are slept downstairs that night. And Marion was on the couch, I believe. And so they were all on the first floor and the other five children were upstairs. And so here is the uh, fire chief and they are looking at, you know, this is the stage photo, obviously, for um, the photographer picking up the dirt because there weren't any remains found there at all. So the children who disappeared were Betty five, Jenny eight, Lewis nine, Martha 12 and Maurice 14. And here's another of the newspaper photographs of excavating the basement area, trying to find remains. And so where, what happened to these kids? Where'd they go? Why did they disappear? And so here are two of the newspaper articles. Um, five children burned, um, Fayetteville, five of the 10 children. And, and again, I mean, uh, can you sense my, my frustration at people who just don't do their research? If you Google Sauter family, you are going to find blogs that just say that they had nine children when in fact they had a 10. They all forget about Joe, who was at the <laughs> way in the military. Um, so um, we have the five children who burned and then um, another story about it. And it just captivated, captivated America. Where did they go? And so there was an investigation. Actually, there were quite a few investigations into what happened. And so again, initially, that morning when they, um, Christmas morning, they see their house is burned down. Excuse me. They believe that they lost five children to fire and then they didn't. And so the family spent the rest of their lives trying to find the children. And in fact, the family um, members, grandchildren, great grandchildren still are looking for the, um, for evidence. You can get on Facebook. There's a Facebook group where they're still trying to find descendants of these children. 
And so we get, so we've got some oddities with this story. It's just, it's just weird, right? Um, we have the encounter with the life insurance salesman, which um, was different, right? Um, we have the arguments about Italian politics, okay? Weird. We have this strange phone call where this female voice calls and asks for a man who doesn't live there. And then we have the missing ladder. We have the two disabled trucks. They found when they investigated that the phone lines were actually, the um, telephone line, singular, was cut. It wasn't burned through. Um, the unanswered calls for assistance, the arrival of the truck six and a half to seven hours later. I mean, why did it take so long? I mean, yeah, it's rural, but it's not that rural, right? Uh, I can, from Atlanta, I can get to West Virginia in seven hours, but that's with the interstate. Um, and then no human rain, remains found. And so the, the um, story gets like even stranger. So we have um, in, um, so after the, um, the, the family is still grieving. So 1945, this happened. 1952, the family actually buys a billboard and puts this billboard up where, you know, have you seen these, these five children? And the reward started at 5,000 and increased to 10,000. But um, people started thinking that the mafia was involved because, you know, they're from Italy. So it's got to be the mafia. Um, the firebomb thrown on the roof um, or the sound she thought she heard. And then the witness accounts. Um, if you go online, um, the witness accounts, they were talking not only about people, neighbors who thought they saw the children in a car, but they would they would have these sightings at a motel. Um, where the five kids were with a family presumed to be speaking Italian when the um, motel employee wanted to see if things were okay or kind of engage them in conversation. They wouldn't talk to them. You had sightings in Florida for them. There was another theory that they were kidnapped and um, placed in an orphanage in, back in Italy it's just horrible and heartbreaking. So this is the um, where the house burned. The family did not rebuild on the side of the house. Instead, what George did was he filled the basement in with dirt and they planted a garden um, of flowers and kind of set up like a memorial garden. But this is like, like the story is strange as it is, but then it gets even stranger. Um, they had hired private investigators to look for their kids. And the first private investigator they hired heard this story that the um, fire department and the police department actually found a box with a human heart buried, buried there. Um, where the house burnt down. And so they, the private investigator, he followed it through and he found out, yes, there is a box with something buried in it. But the fire chief, F.J. Morris, he actually got a beef liver, buried it in a box to um, kind of pass it off as a human heart to set the parents' mind at ease that their children perished in the fire instead of just disappeared in the night. He thought that it was kind of um, maybe easier for them to accept and to get process through, go through the grief pro grieving process if they believe that they died in the fire instead of where are they? Um, George and Jenny actually contacted the FBI and begged them to investigate. The FBI declined to intervene. The governor of West Virginia opened an investigation and investigated it and then closed the matter saying that um, he couldn't do anything. Then it, then it gets even stranger. So 1945 was the fire. In 1968, Jenny receives a letter or an envelope that's addressed strictly to her. And inside of it is the photograph of the man, young man in the middle um, or the on the right. And on the back of the photograph is written, um, Louis Sauter, I love Brother Frankie, I-L-I-L, -I -L, boys, A90132 or 35. 
And so it was postmarked from Kentucky. So the family hires a second private investigator, um, pay him money, and then he disappeared. And the family said that they didn't want to disclose or advertise to the media about this image, receiving this photograph, because they feared for Lewis's life if this was, in fact, Lewis. Um, but then, you know, another strange aspect to the case, which is sad. That was then, and this is now, and this is now is probably like 20 years ago. Um, I don't have the address on where it was. It, um, I think it was Route 16. The street's been actually rena renamed, and so I was doing a property search earlier today to see if I could actually find out or find it to see, um, but I couldn't figure out. And um, I think I found the house, but a lot of the houses look, look alike. But again, they didn't rebuild the house on the site, but Jenny did add on to the house they built on the property. She did add on rooms, which kind of reminded me of Winchester. Um, and um, hold on a second. Can you get me my green one of these? Please. It's in my bag. Thank you. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to get the secret journal. That's got all of the, all of my notes. Excuse me, but it reminded me of Winchester, who built on the room, supposedly dealing with the um, the guilt of her husband owning the gun, um, which I don't. That's a whole nother blog for you to read of mine, but um, but it's it, but it's just so sad. So we have the properties. The last survivor was Sylvia. She was the two-year-old. Um, Sylvia survived. Um, she was the last child who was living up until 2021. Sadly, she died April 21st, 2021 at the age of 79. She did some interviews. There she is um, talking about um, her five siblings. And she really wanted the story to um, people to remember the story and for people to keep searching. To keep searching. What was sad is um, this is a picture of George and Jenny in front of the billboard that was raised to ten thousand dollars for the reward. And um, and again, this is also where I got, I, I'm, I'm going to write a blog on this in terms of the inaccuracies online. People online who um, who have written blogs about it claim that George died in 1968, shortly after receiving the photograph of the um, young man who was supposed to be his deceased son, Lewis. Um, but it, it, it's not. He died in 1969, the next year. Jenny died in 1986. Um, she was a widow for a very long time. Um, and then the billboard came down after her death. And so it is no longer erected. Um, trying. What's interesting is they're both buried in High Lawn Memorial Park in Oak Hill. And I think actually my um, childhood friend from kindergarten lives up there now. And um, her um, spouse's family is Italian community there. And I've got to, I'm going to contact her because I'm fascinated because I think that they're related to the Sauter family, which is kind of sad. And I think her mom is actually buried in the same cemetery. But, um, but yeah, Jenny just couldn't, gosh, she searched so long. She searched her entire life for these kids. Um, so they, the first private investigator was C.C. Tinsley. Um, he found that the, ins the insurance salesman, which is strange, even more strange, is that he was sitting on the coroner's jury. Um, for um, when they were um, determining if they were presumed dead or not. Um, and then um, she hired a pathologist to look at um, the bones for to see because the officials just kept telling her, no, they died in the fire. And she's like, there's no human who reigns. And so when they sampled the, the um, dirt that George filled the basement in with and they planted the garden, when they sampled it, they did find some human remains. It was very scant. It was um, it would only have been 
of remains from um, one individual wasn't like a full skeleton or anything. It was not enough to be the five children. And they believe that it was actually contaminated in the dirt that he got to fill the basement with. So the land actually, the dirt had um, someone else's remains there. Um, gosh, right? Sad. And so... Unsolved crimes and unsolved murders is, there are so many podcasts out there um, on different ones, which is kind of sad because in society in general, we've got all these unsolved murders. But um, if you do want to listen or learn more about them, there are plenty of places to go. Um, and this, you know, this is unfortunately the tip of the iceberg. What happened was when I was researching for haunted Christmas stories, that's how I kind of stumbled on Sauter family and Lawson family. I had heard the stories, but they were kind of like urban legends and I hadn't really done any research or read about them and, um, started looking at them. And then when Heather and Philip were asking about, programs for 2022. I was like, Hey, what about this? And so even though they are linked to Christmas, that was what my motivation was because, you know, it's supposed to be the happiest time of year. I'm looking at unsolved murders. Um, but there's, gosh, there's so many out there, but again, the lesson it really is too. Um, and there's a lot of inaccuracy out there. The internet was supposed to help us get smarter, but I don't think it did. And that's the presentation. So that's me. Um, next month, I'm going to be talking voodoo, voodoo medicine. I'm going to stop sharing so I can come back on. Yeah, that presentation, I think we have scheduled for the 27th. Something like that. I've got it, I've got yeah. it on my calendar. <laughs> and I have it almost yeah. done, done. So I will, <laughs> I, uh, I will be better. <laughs> that's this okay. I will be better. <laughs> There were a few questions about the Sauter family Yeah, when you were talking about it. Um, Robin says the article says the congressman took his own life and she wonders if there could be a connection. No, that was just a different article mm -hmm. from it um, because they, because how the newspapers laid out newspapers um, back then they didn't, photography was expensive. And so they would lay out in columns and they would try to get as much news in there. And so it's kind of hard with the overlap. I probably should have done a better job cropping. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, um, but my, the tidbit I did want to leave you with is with DNA testing. Um, like I know I've submitted my DNA and got my profile from ancestry and everything. I'm curious to see if they did survive. They married, had children and those children or their grandchildren submit their DNA and somehow they get linked. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Right. <laughs> Finally be able to solve it. Right. And, and going back to the newspapers, you just reminded me when I used to be a stringer for a newspaper, we got paid by column inch mm. is how they paid us. <laughs> Ooh, I'd be writing a lot. <laughs> I, I, I did. <laughs> Trust me. I did. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Um, Philip wants to know, did the police ever investigate the insurance man? Yeah, no, he apparently he was fine. And, you know, it, it's so hard because, first of all, living in a, in a city, like I, I, I think that crime has always been solved, right? That it didn't take forever. And then when you go to rural places, even now, a lot of crime isn't solved. Um but I think that he checked out. I don't know. I'm going to actually be doing, I'm going to be writing some blogs this year on, on these. And I'm going to actually get a little bit more information and pull up police reports and the newspaper articles, which I don't get paid by ancestry, but I use it a lot. <laughs> and you can find all of those old articles um, with the newspaper subscription, which is fantastic because if you are, um, I'm in Gainesville. So Gainesville Sun is not in Ancestry, but um, some of the other local paper, papers are. You can research from your the comforts of your own home, which is just fascinating. And they also reported crime different back in the 20s and 40s. They would mm -hmm. show you the pictures, right? Think of um, Black Dahlia. In the original um, photograph of her death, you see her body in the newspaper. 
You don't know. Yep. Yeah. So that was and, long answer, Philip. <laughs> and another place um, to get newspaper clippings, I know you can see previews of them, but to get the whole clipping, you do have to pay for a subscription. It's called rarenewspapers.com. Uh, yeah. And that's a good site that I go to a lot for when I do research. Right. Or go to, yeah. you know, and here's a plug for your local library. Um, go to your local library and see if they have electronic access, um, especially because so many counties now have genealogy departments that yeah. those librarians are as nosy as I am. And they're just waiting for you to come in because mm -hmm. they just want to help you research. Yep. Yeah. I think when I wrote my last book, it was everybody, I contacted a lot of librarians out in Nevada and they were all more than willing to hear. <laughs> oh <laughs> I yeah. I was flooded with info. And that is like free researching. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, then, and they're curious. Mm -hmm. The yeah, family did have money. Know. Okay. They did. Yeah. Sorry. Now I can see them. The questions come up. Oh. They did have money. Um, and um, so that was another um, thing was another theory was that the mafia was extorting them um, for some unknown reason. Um, not like the Lawson family where they're, you know, we had a pregnancy um, kind of thing, but no, they did have money and um, but they didn't flaunt the money. They were hard workers. They um, were, um, they just, you know, they were just like a family with a lot of kids who were, yeah. Because think about it, 1945, a $5,000 cash reward, you had to have money. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then up it to 10000 But I just think it's weird, uh, this um, Fayetteville connection. Because... Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just so sad though. And, um, oh, the question went away. What did he ask? Oh, there it goes. Um, right. I know. Um, if they would do any of the, um, excavating and pull the samples up or, um, gosh, right. And Fayetteville's still, still rural. Um, it's not a big town. Um, and um, they they could, and I would love I would love to pitch that TV show idea and, and go out <laughs> exactly. right, or or be on the team actually investigating it. Yeah, I, I mean I would do the I don't want to be on the camera. I'd be doing all the research and going through stuff and you know compiling and everything for them and finding pictures. That's that's where the fun is. I'd be on my hands and knees digging through the dirt. <laughs> See, we got a team going. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't like getting dirty, but for something like that, I would be more than happy to just dive right in. <laughs> right. But I couldn't, I, I, it's just, that's why when, when I saw these and wanted to know more, it was kind of like five kids. How, how do you lose five kids? How, how do they just disappear? And, um, well, I know Philip's theory earlier was aliens took them. Well, you know, it, it, you know, okay. So like, we're going down a rabbit hole. So, okay. So my, aunt, we got time. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> this is, and, it, and it links with it goes with it, which is fascinating. So Fayetteville, West Virginia, my grandmother's family is Kessler. They um, were given um, land grant when Virginia divided up West Virginia. And so my ancestors got farmland and, and, um, we're living in Fayetteville and, um, there was, they, this is not like appropriate now, but they called her crazy aunt Helen. And so one horrible summer in late seventies, might've been early eighties, my parents sent, sent my sister and me up to West Virginia with my grandmother. So she, so we could stay with her sister in Fayetteville and on this street was like, all of them had houses all next to each other. And Aunt crazy Aunt Helen had a house at the end of the street. It was, she was um, re, um, remodeling it. Um, it was a little strange kind of thing, but local urban legend was that people saw UFOs hovering over crazy Aunt Helen's house in Fayetteville, which, and the street backs up to Route 16, 
where this happened. So he might he might be right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you never know nowadays with what's going on in the world. <laughs> no, you don't. I, I I'm I'm more inclined to think that DNA will be matched. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if right. they if they have surviving and man to that yeah. that would be wow right and, and getting back to your first story um, I grew up in McHenry County which was two hours outside of Chicago and mm -hmm. I've driven that street several times and it's amazing how different it looks than the photos you showed. I was mm -hmm. like, it does even 20 years later. I haven't been there for 20 years. And it's like, it didn't look like it that 20 look years like ago. <laughs> right. And, and again, and that's so, um, you know, I mean, people with their YouTube channels, it, it's kind of lucrative for very few people, but people, you know, can stream something and like, I'll watch some things and people did have never visited or they didn't do their homework. They're looking at old images. And that was this one video, sadly, where, you know, he's investigating the haunting and it's supposed to be these two sisters. And in the comments, people are like, the street's been widened, dude, that this, th this is wrong. This is wrong. This. And then you get the, you know, the one person who's like, loved it. <laughs> like, and also, I mean, going off topic, but the cemetery in Chicago where the white lady is found walking the streets that road has been widened too. So she should be walking down the center of the street, ideally. <laughs> yeah. Not the side because I mean, the cars aren't going to hit her. Right. <laughs> so, so I, so I, I guess we think too much in, into it, but, um, but yeah, no, you're right. And I hadn't really thought about it when, but I was, you know, reading more stories about the widening and everything. And then I, I, devil's Creek, it's like, Mm -hmm. how how weird is that but it would you know it's unfortunate that they didn't and they might they might have evidence that they can dna match right to mm -hmm. see if in the first one if barbara and patricia were killed by this um char um charles leroy melquist but i just thought it was weird how you know people are just kind of thrown out his name years later because he happened to kill somebody, leave them nude. Oh, they don't do that. Um, right. Two miles or a few miles away. So he had to have done it. Right. <laughs> right. And it's like, but, but he, but he's the, he is like the textbook example of stupid criminal. <laughs> right. Who call, who commits the crime and calls up and says, Hey, I witnessed this not cleaning out your car. <laughs> Oh, uh, people like that today would not get away with it. <laughs> no, they, uh, hopefully they don't. Hopefully they don't. Right. And then, um, and then also he got 99 years, but he only, but he got out on 11. He was able to marry, have kids and live the American dream. Mm -hmm. And it's like, something's wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I think this is about the Sauter family still, but what about the older toddler or the older brother? I oh, my, no. glass. my glasses are on my head and I need to put them on. Oh, no, that's, that's why I'm like right here. <laughs> um, it, seems, it seems like to get five kids into a car, they would raise a ruckus unless they knew the person taking them somewhere. Right. Um, okay. So the older brother, Joe, um, he died young, um, sadly, also. Um, I forget what age. Um but you're right to corral five kids on Christmas morning. I mean, they're even more hyper, right? Because they already opened some gifts. They're going to get some more gifts. Um, and so how do you get them in the car? And if it's supposed to be, didn't they hear the car pull up? It, it's just, gosh, there's so many questions that I kind of want to go back in time and be the, be the police officer investigating with, you know, my knowledge today on what to ask. I don't think people thought about it. Nope. So, and I think, nope. and, and you know, what's sad is they probably dismiss them because they, because the, the police department and the fire department wanted it to be that they burned in the fire and they didn't want to do any other investigating at mm -hmm. all. Right. And, um, and I think that when, it came back that there weren't any human remains. They were like, oh, crap. 
because they didn't do a full investigation. And so they lost, uh, I think they lost like a couple weeks of time to actually do, do a proper investigation. Yeah. And back then, by that time, they'd be across country, if not out of country. Gone, right? Gone. Yeah. Yep. So it, horrible. Yeah. But that also reminds me, um, going back to the first one, the Lawson sisters, Mm -hmm. What's this one of them, oh crap, let me see, had an older sister who died. And it's not, uh, yeah, she, they did. They had, um, so they died in, um, vanished 1958, um, or um, 56 rather. And they had uh, an older sister, Leona, who died at 26 year old years of age, two years before that, 1954. So the mother had already experienced heartbreak. And, and in that situation, you almost wonder if it was family. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what the mom said. She said, because some of the reports were that um, they saw them giggling and one of um, they were playing peekaboo behind, um, they were walking down like Main Street. And so um, the um, entrances into like the drugstore or the department store or anything, they were playing peekaboo and they were giddy and happy and talking to boys in cars. And the mom's like, if they didn't know who it was, they weren't getting in the car. Mm -hmm. And, but... They, but as a mom, you would hope that. You oh my know, God, right? You, you would hope that, but you never know what your children will do. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. The other story that um, I didn't think we would have time to talk about that I was going to talk about was um, 1955, two nine-year-old um, boys who were friends mm -hmm. who disappeared out of the blue. Um, and there is, a re if, you, if you're fascinated by this, um, milk carton kids, right? Um, if you remember the kids on the milk carton, face on the milk carton, yep. um, there is an excellent podcast on 99% Invisible. It's probably four years old about Johnny Grosh, who was the first boy on the face of the milk carton. And we all mm -hmm. think that the milk carton campaign was incredibly successful because we've all heard about it because it's so ingrained in our popular culture. Yeah. It was actually a failure. It didn't, it didn't mm -hmm. find anybody except one kid. One kid and or actually two kids. And um, they were, um, and I think both of them were um, parent abductions, but the one girl who actually, and it's heartbreaking to hear this story, the mother um, father were getting divorced. And so the mother snatched her fled, lived out on an Island in, in Hawaii and all kinds, just to not let the father have um, shared custody. And, um, she and the stepfather went to the store, like one of the few times that she was allowed out of the house to go anywhere. They went to the grocery store and um, the stepdad saw her picture on the milk carton and said, hey, you know who this is? Shh, it's our little secret. And so he bought the milk carton. She kept it, put it in her Barbie case, and she was allowed to play with the kids next door. And she took her Barbie case over and she left it. And the, the neighbor found it and called the police. But 99% Invisible has a, has a great podcast on that. Okay. Milk carton kids. Let's check that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Yeah, because you would think that would be successful. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody drinks milk. <laughs> mm -hmm. You would, right? And um, when um, Johnny Grosh, when he disappeared, legislation didn't, or um, policy and law didn't separate children, missing, missing children from missing adults. And so when she called and said her son was missing, the police were like, nope, can't report it yet. And she's like, he's a kid. He, they're like, nope, can't report it yet. And so they started looking for him and they were the ones who went out and did the early, like the interviews because he had a paper route. And so mm -hmm. they got, talked to people, talk, called the friends and all this stuff. And so then um, she wrote the legislation to change that at her dining room table. Yep. Yeah. Horrible. It's amazing what moms can do when they're passionate about something. <laughs> uh, don't poke mama bear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So yeah, those, so that's my okay. thing. And then my subtle voodoo. <laughs> I love New Orleans. <laughs> Quackery. And um, this is totally off topic, but tied into next month's topic. Um, if anybody ever has a chance to be in New Orleans, go to the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum because it it is oh, it, it's so unassuming that you wouldn't think that there was much in it and it's beautiful. Right. So, yeah. Now I'm hoping to get there soon and actually we're hoping to host a conference there soon. So <sighs> hopefully we can get everything working out the way we want it to. <laughs> really? Cause you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'll be there. Uh, <laughs> I love new Orleans and I'm just so happy with COVID that I would, um, I went in February and just so, so happy to be able to travel there again. Yeah, my, my fascination is Gettysburg and Williamsburg. So I need to branch out and try some new places. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, it It's just, it's magical and it's haunted. Mm -hmm. and, and, there, and there are two different realms that kind of overlap just a little mm -hmm. bit. And um, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. in a different way you know right i mean they saw a war there but not like gettysburg that just had all of the blood shedding and just you know mm -hmm. all of that intense emotion um so it's it's a different kind of energy but um but man there's a lot of hauntings there yeah and also yeah. a lot I, of there's online <laughs> right yeah i think my obsession with gettysburg is just because i feel connected there mm. I, you know, I was talking on that with my last show with Frankie, and uh, it, it's just, I feel like I'm at home hmm. when I'm there. So it's interesting. Now, do you think maybe it's like a past life connection or? That's what we're thinking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause it's, I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia. Okay. And I've always been, I don't really want to use the word fan because can you really be a fan of a war? But I've always been interested in the Civil War, and I've done a lot of research on it and studying on it. And it's all the Civil War sites are my favorite places to go. And it, it just there's a real connection there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. <laughs> yeah, that's um, I, I I totally understand. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So and and real quick, getting back to your, if anyone's looking for haunted crime scene. Um, I've read Blood and Ghosts several times. It's by Mark Nesbitt. And I know Mark. He's the author of um, Ghosts of Gettysburg. <laughs> and he it's also does life. the candlelight. <laughs> yeah, I know. He does the candlelight tours in Gettysburg. And he's a real great guy. And this book talks about psychics used in crime scenes, um, unsolved crime scenes dating back all the way to the 1600s. Um, he talks about Bonnie and Clyde and it just, your presentation reminded me of how they presented the crime scenes in these books. Oh, excellent. So it was really, and I'm hoping to get him or care. Um, is it Karen? Yeah. Karen on an episode in the future. Isn't it interesting? The, um, the evolution of using psychics, mm -hmm. how, so, cause we had the one psychic who they were like, no, he can't be psychic. He had to be the one who killed them. <laughs> Because why else would he dream about it? And mm -hmm. and now it's like families who can't get answers through the normal channels. Mm -hmm. Who do they turn to? Psychics. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any little piece of information can help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean, and there are frauds out there, but, you know, the true psychic helping can it's, sometimes it's just just a little, little piece that comes mm -hmm. through that can be, you know, a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's funny because you talk about the frauds. Um, I work with Chris McKinnell and the Warren foundation and his test to pull out the frauds from the real ones is to actually go to a psychic and say, I want information on my dead uncle Ted, but you don't have a dead uncle Ted. Mm -hmm. If they come back with information, you know, 99% of the time they're fake. Yeah, then you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, your Uncle Ted's standing right behind you. It's like, I don't have an Uncle Ted. <laughs> and he wants to tell you something so important, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, I work with psychics all the time. And, you know, some of them are spot on and others, 
you know, you, you know, they're not always right, mm -hmm. but you can definitely pinpoint the frauds from the real ones. Yes, you can. And, yeah. um, I sat on a panel once at Dragon Con with, um, I think he was a former police officer who, um, that was, that was his thing was, um, exposing fraudulent psychics mm -hmm. who people had turned over vast amount of money and this person was a fraud and it was like, gosh, man, how can, how can that, oh, the guilt and the, your soul's not going anywhere good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But um, but his presentation was real. I mean, sadly, you know, it, it's just another con, and mm -hmm. um, so they he, he, oh, it was heartbreaking, right? And in this field, it's so hard to determine who's real and who's not because how can you prove that someone's a psychic or not outside of asking mm -hmm. them to look for false information, right? Yeah, which feels bad because you don't want to trick them, but well, how? Right. What else do you do? Right. And who's to say, I mean, in the paranormal field, there's so many unanswered questions. Who's to say, because you're thinking of a dead Uncle Ted that you don't have, that they're picking up on that. Right. Or it could be um, like my um, my dad was an only child and one of his very good friends, we called Uncle Dick. Yeah. They're not, not related, you know, um, brothers by a different mother kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, it, it, you know, it's just. Oh gosh, isn't that horrible? Yep. It, it is, but you know, it's the world we live in. We just mm -hmm. gotta navigate it. <laughs> but it is exciting for me when I am around like a true psychic who will say something, and it's like, gosh, those yep. are some awesome skills. <laughs> exactly. I, I had I had one on. I was being interviewed on a show probably a couple months ago, and I never really talked about my grandfather just because I didn't have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And someone had come across saying, hey, do you know someone by this name? And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> that was my grandfather who died three years ago. And I never had a connection with him, but they said that he was there wanting to relay a message. And I'm just like, and nowhere, I mean, it would be nowhere on social media because I haven't talked to him since social media came around. Yeah. And How in that sense, it's like, they're real. And, you know, because... I don't have any connection or any sharing of that information. <laughs> what a cool story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Cause it's like, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. It is interesting because you know, how do you react to that in terms of, Oh, and, and at first I didn't think of it because they said the formal name of it, not the informal version of it. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know. And then later on, I was like, oh, crap. Yes. <laughs> and, then, and then you look kind of weird, like, oh, yeah, you don't know your own family. <laughs> I don't because I haven't talked to him in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all like that. We all have, right, we all exactly. have those special people. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, families are weird. <laughs> and that's because we can't pick them. No. I was, I was just going to say the people who I have selected for my family are really pretty weird also, but in a good way. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So unless you have anything else to say, you can I go ahead and let everyone know where to find you. I am, um, so I'm Lisa, but I blog as the haunted librarian. So it's the haunted librarian.com. It's all, all three words together. And, um, I am getting better now that I have settled down in Gainesville of writing some more blogs and getting a little bit more active. And um, so you can find me online there and on Twitter at Haunted LIB, which is short for Haunted Librarian. Okay, sounds good. And as I mentioned earlier, make sure you follow us on Facebook at Ghost Education 101. And um, hopefully if things go well, we will have our YouTube channel back up. And we will be back August or August. Not yet. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> April, thir April 13th, we'll be having a pa roundtable panel discussion on paranormal tourism versus paranormal research. We'll have Robert Murphy, Chelsea Grill, Larry Lawson, and Chris McKinnell joining us for that discussion.
So again, thank you for joining us. It was a great presentation and I can't wait to see your presentation in about a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Heather. So, thank you everyone for joining us and have a great night.